um, starting it on Facebook. Okay, great. I'm going to be on both to see how it works. And then I guess she can mute all of us up here. And Glenn, it's saying that you need to start my video. Um, Hillary can do that. Uh, she's the, the host. Or the host, yes. Sorry. Yes. Sorry. Hello, everyone. Hi, Leo. Good to see you. Nice to nice that you're here. It's a good nice. crowd. I see that I see a Facebook icon at the top of the screen there. So I wonder if we're ready to to begin. Are we, Hillary? Really? Almost. Neville, is there any way that you can turn your camera on? When I try, it says I'm unable to start video because the host has stopped it. Oh, that's great. How about now? Hello. There you are. Okay. Fantastic. Hi, Neville. Hi, Glenn. Okay, Tara, I think we are ready to go. Uh, Hillary, are we recording? Almost. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. Great to see a, a good crowd here tonight. Uh, welcome to a special public forum about sea-based aquaculture, Thank how it's embraced by the provincial government, and the negative effects on human and marine welfare. My name is Tara Manuel. I am co-chair of EnviroWatch NL, and we're an independent, nonprofit, citizens-based provincial group formed about a year ago to bring more transparency and accountability into government decision-making on matters affecting the environment. As a volunteer-run organization that does not accept corporate nor government funding, we encourage you as a citizen to become a financial supporter or an active member of our group. Uh, you can go to our website um, to do that. We're at envirowatchnl.com, or you can visit our Facebook page. So the other co-chair of EnviroWatchNL is Glenn Wheeler, whom many of you may know from the Mi'kmaq Matters podcast. Uh, and Mi'kmaq Matters is also streaming this on its Facebook page. In a few weeks, this discussion from tonight will also be available for viewing on Rogers Community TV on their Local Matters show in Western and Central Newfoundland. And we thank Rogers for that. And we'll be posting the uh, times on our Facebook page and our website. So uh, to begin, we at EnviroWatch NL feel that there is an urgent need for a discussion on fish farms and sea-based aquaculture in our province. Farmed salmon is marketed in the grocery stores as a healthy and affordable food rich in nutrients. However, the well-established fact is that fish farms are harmful to wild salmon and also to the marine environment. And that's why many places around the world are limiting or banning fish farms entirely. Places like Washington State, Denmark, Argentina, and they're being phased out on the west coast of Canada and BC. Unfortunately, here in Newfoundland and Labrador, it's a different matter. Despite the many problems, including a mass die-off of farmed salmon a few years ago, the provincial government is a reliable cheerleader for the aquaculture industry. And at this very moment, they are pushing a plan to populate most of the south coast of the island with farms. In fact, the government's uncritical support for aquaculture threatens a marine conservation area proposed for the spectacular south coast fjords of Newfoundland. It's hard not to draw the conclusion that the government of Newfoundland and Labrador appears to care more for fish farms than for marine conservation. And sadly, the people in this province do not get a complete picture of the issues at stake. 
And I think they might be shocked to learn some of the disturbing facts about the local industry. Like, for instance, since open net pen aquaculture began on the South Coast, wild salmon numbers on the Con River have declined 98% from 10,000 annually to just 200. Or that the NL aquaculture industry uses 1,000 times more antibiotics to treat disease than is used in other aquaculture jurisdictions. Or that despite both federal and provincial governments subsidizing the expansion of the industry to the tune of tens of millions of dollars over the last 15 years, production levels in Newfoundland farms have actually decreased from 26,000 to 7,000 metric tons annually. The media run predictable news stories about how the industry provides much needed jobs for struggling rural communities. However, we hear almost nothing about the impact of salmon aquaculture on other fisheries, such as lobster and the smaller fish that end up as feed. Fish farms were promoted as a way to help feed the world, but instead they consume valuable sources of protein that would be available for human consumption, especially in developing countries. So thankfully tonight, we've got an excellent group of speakers here to explore these issues with us and to help educate us tonight on this issue. So I'd like to turn it over to Glenn right now to introduce the panel and to tell the audience about the format for tonight. Thanks, Tara. We're very pleased to have with us uh, a great group of speakers. Um, Catherine Collins and Douglas France are authors of a, an important book called Salmon Wars, The Dark Underbelly of Our Favorite Fish. Uh, Doug has worked in journalism at the New York Times and the LA Times and Catherine has uh, worked at the Chicago Tribune and elsewhere and Doug and Catherine are joining us from their current home base in Nova Scotia. So Catherine and Doug, great to have you with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bob Chamberlain has served seven terms on the Council of His First Nation. He has served three terms as Vice Chief of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, and he's currently Chair of the First Nation Wild Salmon Alliance, which has been active in um, the fight against uh, fish farms on the coast of BC. And Bob is joining us from balmy British Columbia, where it's still only the middle of the afternoon. So Bob, great to see you again. And Neville Crabb is uh, Executive Director of Communications for the Atlantic Salmon Federation and organization dedicated to the conservation and restoration of the wild Atlantic salmon. And um, the Atlantic Salmon Federation uh, is uh, based in uh, headquarters in New Brunswick, but Neville, your, uh, the organization is active um, in the uh, Northeast, uh, Canada and, and the US, and very active in Newfoundland. Uh, where uh, you have uh, an increased presence of leads. So we're hoping to, um, we look forward to hearing uh, more about that uh, from you, uh, ASF's uh, work in, uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador. So Tara, that's our panel. And um, so audience, uh, our format is, uh, is like this. There will be three mini conversations with uh, our panelists between the mini conversations. The other panelists can respond, um, add, um, say um, what uh, they will about uh, what the other panelists um, have said. And then at the end, uh, we will have time for your questions, questions from the audience. And please feel free to um, submit your question at any time as, uh, as it occurs to you. And there may be, we may, uh, if it's, uh, we can find a, um, a spot we might um, try to fit it in uh, before the end if it's um, related to something um, that's been uh, said uh, just at that moment. So we'll do our best to be spontaneous with uh, getting the questions in. Tara, back to you. Okay, so we'd like to start our discussion with uh, Catherine and Doug. Um, and of course, we wanna talk about your book, 
I have their book right here. It's excellent. Um, I encourage people to pick it up. Uh, you'll learn an awful lot. And there's quite a bit about Newfoundland in here that um, will be guaranteed uh, eye-opening. Um, so Catherine and Doug, the book um, takes a very broad sweep of aquaculture. You give an overview of the industry that is dominated by Norwegian-based multinationals. You talk about the environmental impacts and the suppression of scientific information by the industry. You talk a lot about Newfoundland and about the mass die-off in 2019. And, and obviously, you've traveled a lot in the province. I wonder, could you talk to us a bit, please, about how Newfoundland figures in the global aquaculture industry, especially keeping in mind what I mentioned in my preamble, that many other jurisdictions are moving away from open net pen, sea-based aquaculture, while, while we're not. Sure. Shall I start? Yes. yes. Um, I, I like to start at the beginning, and I'm going to read you something that a Norwegian member of parliament uh, told, once told the Canadian Parliamentary Committee in Ottawa. He said about Norway, we are very strict about the quality and environment questions. Therefore, some of the fish farmers want to go to Canada. They said, he's referring to his fish farmers, we want bigger fish farms in a place where we can do exactly what we like. That is a very hot subject, I think. And, and I suspect that your, your listeners would be surprised to hear that he said this back in December of 1990. And some things have never changed. Norway continues to be one of the largest producers of farm salmon. They produce about half the farm salmon in the world. Their mortality rates are like what you see everywhere in the world, between 10 and 25% every year. Interestingly, you mentioned Con River. Every year, 200,000 fish are reported to escape from these Norwegian fish farms. It's probably more than that. And as a result, 71% of Norway's rivers are considered genetically polluted because of these escaped salmon. The population of wild salmon in Norway, as in other places, is estimated to have been cut by half in the last 20 years. The situation is so critical that the government has stopped issuing new licenses for open net pan salmon farming in Norway. And yet Norway likes the government likes to brag that it has the strictest agriculture, aquaculture regulations in the world. They no longer uh, issue new licenses for ocean-based salmon farms, although licenses for land-based farms for RAS facilities are free. They hold an annual auction so that if you want to increase the population of your salmon farm, you must bid for the right to do so. And in addition to a 25% corporate tax, Norway has just recently instituted a new 25% fee. So Norway, while Norway monitors and restricts sea lice levels, stocking density and escapes, this is the reason they can brag that they are doing better than the rest of us. But it's important for people to consider in Canada, the harder it gets in Norway, they're looking for other places to go as they were 30 plus years ago. So look out Maritimes, look out Newfoundland, look out British Columbia. This is a very serious problem. And, and as you mentioned, elsewhere in the world, countries or states, countries are stepping up and trying to get a hold, get a handle on this expanding industry. Washington state, for example, recently joined the rest of the West Coast states in the United States and banned the farming of non-native thin fish. Argentina has banned open net pen salmon farms completely. Just this week, Chile, where much of the, the cheap salmon in the world is raised, they've reached an agreement between the government and two of the main salmon farmers, including Cook Aquaculture, I'm sure you know that name, to remove all of their concessions in national parks and adjacent areas to sites that are not under environmental protections. And other countries like Iceland and Tasmania um, are also fighting open net pen farms on their coastlines. And you're seeing other forms of resistance. There's a uh, I mean, there are, there are lots of things. There are so many environmental groups, you can't even count them. But there's also something called the Global Salmon, GSFR, Global Salmon Farming Resistance, Resistance which is a, a, a coalition of scientists and NGOs and individuals devoted to the fight against open net pan salmon farms and trying to get them out of the water. And you have really interesting creative approaches like the Off the Table campaign that has been launched by the UK charity called wildfish.org. And we're trying to bring this to Canada. And if we can't count on our governments and our regulators to take salmon farms off our coastlines, perhaps consumers can
can take it off their plates. And if you get rid of the demand, perhaps these companies will stop uh, ruining our coastlines. Okay, well, <laughs> that's hopefully that's something we can play a small part in here tonight in raising awareness in our community uh, about the harms from this industry and, um, you know, and, and influence people to stop buying it and eating it because uh, that's likely to make more of a difference. I hope so. It, it seems to be, Tara, that the only hope may be consumer response. If people stop buying it, they'll stop growing it. And so that's that's the one reason why Catherine and I, although we're lifelong journalists, have have moved a little bit into an activist role because we were so convinced that these open net pen salmon farms have to come out of the water to protect the environment, to protect the health of wild salmon and to protect our own health, because this fish is not healthy for many people to eat, particularly pregnant women and infants and children because of the impact of the toxins on brain development. And so, you know, consumers are the answer here. It's very tough because the industry has a very slick marketing campaign. You see all these wonderful words, sustainable, naturally raised, feeding the world. You know, it's not true, unfortunately. I wish it were true, but it's not. And that solution in our mind is to get these, these floating feedlots out of the water. Right. Um, before I move on to my next question, I, I just wanted to, to comment on um, the quote you read from the Norwegian government. They're speaking about Canada as if we are a, a third world country, a lesser developed nation uh, in, in their attitude toward uh, the permissiveness of our regulations here. That well, our governments allow things that are not allowed in Norway. And Well, if you look, they're not wrong, are they? I no. mean, as we look across the entire world here, um, you see governmental resistance to these open net pen salmon farms in many places, as you said, and as Catherine said, but in Newfoundland in particular, they have been welcomed with open arms. And at every turn, the government has not only bent over backwards to provide them with licenses and provide them with access to more and more of that beautiful coastline that we all love, but they've invested millions and millions of taxpayer dollars in this industry. At the same time, it's destroying the environment that makes Newfoundland and Labrador what they are. And, and it doesn't provide that many jobs. It really doesn't. In terms of the wild fish industry, which is a, a large and important industry in the province, it's the reason the province was founded, compared to that aquaculture is really just a sliver. Yes, it is. And, and this is one of the things that the industry says all the time, but we bring you jobs and you guys need jobs. Well, that's true. Newfoundland needs jobs. Nova Scotia needs jobs. But we don't need bad jobs. We don't need jobs that destroy other and marine uh, businesses and other fisheries. And the numbers are not that great. I've looked at um, the Newfoundland. I know in Nova Scotia, they only employ about 250 people uh, province-wide. Compare that to the number of people who work in the lobster industry. But I pulled a Nova Scotia, uh, Newfoundland document today, a labor document, has said that the seafood industry employed 17,500 people throughout Newfoundland and Labrador but only 579 work in aquaculture. Another Newfoundland study put that number closer to 300. And disturbingly, those jobs aren't great jobs. They were the annual salary. The median income is something like 19,000. Yeah. Yes, yes. These are, they are the government's statistics. Um, I, I, I wanna move on. Uh, uh, and I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about um, you talk about a, you tell a really interesting story in your book about a diver from the south coast of Newfoundland named Joaquin Drew. I wonder if you could tell us his, his story, please. Well, first of all, I would like to say that we have nothing against the people who work in this industry. People need jobs, even bad jobs or dangerous jobs. But just as the fossil fuel industry has to find a way to, to transition their workers out of those jobs I believe that the aquaculture industry needs to, to change its practices and help these people move out of those jobs too. But Joaquin, 
he was a diver and uh, he took us below the waterline to this to show us, to illustrate to us the, the nasty business that that occurs below the waterline. It looks so nice from the from the surface that below the surface, nothing. It's it's awful. His story is instructive, I think, in two ways. First, he shows that these are dangerous jobs and difficult jobs and not necessarily good jobs. And second, as a diver, he witnessed firsthand the environmental issues and the animal welfare concerns that you see at these at these farms. For example, he, he told us about a super chill event in 2014 where the sustained cold air temperatures, you know, when the temperatures drop really low and the fish rise to the surface, their, their gills and blood can freeze and they die. And then they sink down in the pens and the, the dead fish pile up. And he described one time where this was happening at one of the farms and he was instructed by the farm uh, managers to dive below the farm, slit the nets and release those fish. You know, he was following orders and you're not supposed to do that. When fish are released into the wild, they return the nutrients to nature. But if you release a whole mass, thousands and thousands of fish into the, the seabed below, it has a, it depletes the oxygen supply and has an impact on other marine life in the area. And that was a, you know, just a terrible situation. Um, another time he found um, a whole bunch of sharks. It was about two dozen sharks, about 20 sharks in a pen. And you're not supposed to kill sh sharks. There are lots of predators that are attracted to these farms, tuna, sharks, dolphins, eagles, but they found so many, normally they would catch them and take them out. But as you know, you can't pull a, a shark by the tail, it drowns. So they have to go, they were told to kill them. And you can't take these sharks home and feed them to people. They were just let go and, and to, to float to the bottom. And the final story was, it was a particularly sad story. He was so engrossed in his work and it's very difficult work. And you're in a very closed environment where you, the visibility is very low. And he made a mistake and ran out of oxygen and um, was sent to a hospital on the mainland and has not been able to dive since then. And this point, this goes to my point that these are not safe jobs, they're difficult jobs. And, and these, these incidents aren't always reported. Uh, there's, no, there's no central registry to record these deaths. And so they're just reported as isolated incidents. I read only one study that, where there's a list of the deaths that happened in happened in the aquaculture industry, and it came out of Chile, of all places. And in 2019, the country's union of divers reported 15 deaths in their industry alone. So this is this is a very serious issue for these people who work on these farms doing these tough jobs. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, so another. Um, you you talk about in your book um well a lot of the environmental issues associated with fish farms you talk about uh, sea lice um infectious salmon anemia um and you also talk about something that maybe people aren't as aware of um as an issue with fish farms and that's the effect that they might have on other industries like lobster fishing um and that's a big industry on the south coast in this province and i i wonder if you would share with us what you think people on the South Coast who work in that industry should know about uh, potential impacts to their industry from fish farms. Yeah, we're happy to do that, Tara. Um, what they need to know is the same thing that lobster fishermen need to know here in Nova Scotia. And, and there is a growing awareness in Nova Scotia of this problem. The open net pen salmon farms dump pesticides, antibiotics and other chemicals into the water. As far back as 2015, Canadian government scientists have shown that these chemicals harm lobsters and other marine life. A DF, DFO study in 2022 of plans to expand uh, salmon farming here in Liverpool Bay in Nova Scotia warned that chemical pollution from salmon farms can spread as far as 3.8 kilometers. And so it gets into the water column and it spreads and it's toxic to lobsters, toxic to other shellfish. And those chemicals, they combine, if they stay, if they don't get dispersed, if you have a low water, a low current around your, around your salmon farms, the chemicals go to the bottom where they combine with excrement and excess feed from the farms 
to create a toxic stew on the seabed. And this stew depletes oxygen and it produces dissolved sulfides and ammoniums. And these conditions damage and drive away lobsters and other marine life. There was a fascinating study here that was reported in a peer reviewed uh, paper in 2018. I should preface this by saying lobsters locate food, they identify mates and predators and choose where to live and breathe based on odors. And the plumes from salmon farms drive them away. And the proof of this is in the paper done in 2018 by a researcher at Dalhousie University named Inka Maluski and other marine biologists. And they published this paper, paper on the impact of a single small salmon farm on lobsters in Port Mattoon Bay on the south coast of Nova Scotia. 15 lobstermen reported their catches from 2007 to 2018. And what those reports showed was that lobster catches had dropped by 42% and the number of egg bearing lobsters had declined by 56%. And if you compare salmon farming with lobstering in Newfoundland or Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island or New Brunswick, our economies depend far more heavily on lobsters than they do on salmon farms. And in, for instance, one of the places we visited um, was Harbor Breton in Newfoundland, where we went out. We went out on a boat with Gary Snook, who's a lobsterman, and Gary had seen these impacts there, and he was concerned that he's getting near retirement age, and he was concerned that his the boats and the license in which he'd invested his life savings were not going to be worth as much because of declining catches. So this has a real world impact and it's something that governments just choose to ignore. I mean, Newfoundland's got its head in the sand on this problem and Nova Scotia, unfortunately, is no better and New Brunswick may in fact be worse. Well, we have our work cut out for us. Yeah. Um, before I move on, I have a couple more uh, questions for you, Catherine and Doug, but I'd just like to ask people who are who have joined on Zoom to mute. Keep your microphone and camera off, please, um, while we chat with our guests. Thank you. Um, yeah. So one thing I wanted to ask about is the labeling of salmon and uh, what... You. Like you see, and you know, where when we go to the grocery store, we see a label uh, fresh Atlantic salmon, uh, and people might not even think anymore about what they're buying. And they, you know, they, they trust that what they're buying is fresh Atlantic salmon, not uh, farmed salmon. And it's cheaper than like wild caught cod um, right now. So I just wonder uh, could you talk a little bit about labeling and what you'd like to see, please? Sure. What we'd like to see is, in fact, pretty simple, and that is we'd like to see a QR code on fresh Atlantic salmon, similar to what you see on so many other products on grocery shelves that you could point your smartphone at and you could see where this was raised. You could see that it was farmed and you would have a list of the chemicals, the pesticides, the antibiotics and the other chemicals that were used there. That would solve this problem. That may be a step too far initially. So perhaps a better thing to do is to require all of these farmed Atlantic salmon, the open net pen salmon, to be labeled as farmed. And you don't find that very often. We were in Toronto about a year ago and we were in this, uh, this fancy supermarket there and they had a whole section of seafood marked sustainable seafood. And it was a huge sign. And we thought, boy, this is great. This is exciting. It was Farm Boys, a very fancy one for folks who know T.O. And we went there and we looked and looked like this was farm salmon. All it said was fresh Atlantic salmon. So we called the manager over and we asked him, where did this come from? And he said, oh, I don't know. Um, I think it's farmed. And I said, where? What's the story here? And so he went and about 15 minutes later, he came back with a sheet of paper. Clearly he stalled thinking we would leave, but we were more <laughs> persistent than that. <laughs> And when he came back, he said, oh, this salmon comes from a small family farm in the Bay of Fundy. And we said, what's the name of that farm? And he gave us the name of it. And we said, no, that's not a small family farm. 
That farm, family farm is part of the Mui family <laughs> of salmon farms. One of the big offenders. Giant multinational. Yes, a giant multinational. And, the, you know, and that's what they were selling as sustainable. And it is no way sustainable. Farmed Atlantic salmon is no long, is no way sustainable. And, you know, it's also a problem. We're, we're, from, we're fans of recirculating aquaculture systems that raise salmon on land in tanks. They don't pollute the water. They don't have escapes that, that can interbreed with wild salmon. There are a lot of good reasons for that. But those aqua, those RAS systems are still using the same feed. As you said, Tara, that comes from feeder fish, pelagic fish that should be going onto human plates, particularly in lower income countries. And so until the feed issue gets solved, you, you might want to not eat any farmed Atlantic salmon, frankly. Uh, yeah, you, I, I, I did enjoy that. I, I mean, I love the idea of being able to eat sustainable salmon. And uh, you did describe, you talked about a company in Nova Scotia and one in California that are doing sustainable land-based closed containment systems. Um, but the but the feed is still an issue. I mean, there's some work being done on that, isn't there, to to come up with alternate ideas for feed uh, other than? It, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. There's a company here in Nova Scotia called Oberlin AgriScience. And this is not the only thing that's happening around the world, but it, for some reason, it really fascinates me. They raise black soldier fly. And what salmon eat is a specific type of protein. And remember, when salmon are born, they eat insects. So that specific type of protein that you find in the wild pelagic fish off places like the West Coast of Africa is exactly this, or is very similar to what you find, what you find in black soldier fly larvae. And they grow these black soldier flies by the gazillions. And they're using those as the basis for the protein and the salmon feed used by Sustainable Blue. And it's still in the testing stage, although it's going to be done, I believe, later this year. And at some point, about a year ago, I asked what kind of difference this would make for the situation with the wild fish. And I was told uh, that for the first two years of a salmon's life, it can uh, grow only with feed based on the black soldier fly larva. They may need uh, fish oil and other fish products as they grow out in the final stage where they can only tolerate 40% of their feed coming from the insect um, part of the equation. And also people use algal oil and, and other things to create sustainable feed. And this is important not only for salmon feed, but you see uh, these fish from around the world, these wild fish used in pet food, if you can believe it or not. Um, how about lobsters? You could perhaps there there you could perhaps use black this type of feed to uh, bait lobster traps. There are all sorts of ways we can address this issue, leave fish in the ocean where they belong, or to be eaten by humans. You know, much higher up in the in the food chain, and it's, it makes a lot more sense. We should not be feeding these fish that are suitable for human consumption to. Uh, grow our fancy salmon, to eat in our fancy restaurants. It's just not right. One statistic, and we'll leave this issue. But yes. <laughs> it takes 440 wild fish to raise a single farm salmon to market weight. 440 do, wild fish. Do the math. It doesn't work. It's Tara, I, I wonder if I could uh, uh, butt in here sure. to uh, forward to, to ask a question um, from a listener, uh, a viewer, who says it's not economically possible to raise Atlantic salmon on land. That's why GMO salmon have been invented. They make on-land salmon economically possible. And the viewer also says that fishing wild salmon is not sustainable, perhaps because of the um, the low numbers. So, um, is he talking about Pacific salmon or wild Pacific salmon? Uh, <clears throat> not specified. Go ahead. No, I don't want to deal with GMO. <laughs> well, um, G look, I mean, it's it's a it's a legitimate question. Is it sustainable? Is it economically feasible to raise Atlantic salmon in tanks on land? Certainly, the over the capital costs going forward are more expensive, and this is a disruptive technology. 
So there have been problems, but what we're seeing, particularly here in Nova Scotia at Cape company called Cape Door and another one, Sustainable Blue, is that it is becoming economical to do it. It's a couple of dollars more per pound in our, at our fishmongers here, Dory Mates, to buy Sustainable Blue or Cape Door salmon, as opposed to the stuff that comes from Cook Aquaculture that they've raised in their open net pen salmon farms. It's a couple of dollars more right now, but it's the cost is coming down. There's parity in the, in the, in the move movement, but also more importantly here, when you go to a store and buy salmon, you have a choice. Are you going to buy, pay a little more for something that is sustainable for something that doesn't pollute the ocean, that doesn't kill wild salmon? Are you willing to do that? Or are you going to buy this other crap? And may I say one more thing about the money situation? Because it does, it's apples and oranges. Land-based salmon farms are paying their own bills. The taxpayer has been on the hook to support these open net pen salmon feedlots for decades. They get government money all the time. So, and they're, and they're using a public asset. They're using the ocean that belongs to you and me. It's free to them. Our, our leases here are minimal compared to what they pay in Norway. And, it is, and so land-based farms have, yes, they have to build their structures. They have to pay for their electricity. But I would also argue that there are more, there's more than one way to evaluate these, these farms economically. Because as they move to land-based salmon farms, their carbon footprint is going down, believe it or not. You might think that because they have concrete and electricity, their carbon footprint is higher. Not true. If you feed them with locally created grown salmon feed that has to travel 50 kilometers across the province, as opposed to halfway around the world where they're pillaging the wild stocks off the west coast of Africa, where half the fishing stocks off the wild, wild, west coast of Africa are in a state of decline. So rather than shipping these container-sized boats of wild fish over here to feed our salmon, let's just grow black soldier flies, drive them across the province for 50 kilometers, and you'll see that things even out. No? Yes? How come you're not touching the subject on GMO salmon? Because they're... <laughs> They have created GMO salmon to make it economically sustainable to produce them on land. And uh, you guys seem to have an issue with that as well. So you're not well, looking for solutions. Of yeah, course GMO we're looking salmon, for GMO salmon allow salmon to be produced at a faster rate so that it's economically feasible to produce on land. So what is your issue with GMO salmon? Our issue, there is only one producer worldwide using GMO salmon now, right. that's Aqua Bounty, and they've had some difficulties. But I think our objection is that it's sold without being labeled as GMO, and that we would rather see natural salmon raised in the most natural way possible in these tanks. Um, we just, we don't like this genetic monkeying around with salmon genes. That's, it's as simple as that. And, and Aqua Bounty has had great difficulty in terms of marketing their their production and and um, and keeping production um, uh, up up to up to status. So why? I, I why wonder. Should uh, they have sorry, to sorry, Laura. Just uh, one second. I wonder, Bob and uh, Neville, if uh, you have anything <laughs> to add to what um, Catherine and uh, Doug have said uh, about. Um, the situation um, in uh, Newfoundland and elsewhere. Um, we'll be turning to you uh, next, Bob, for the situation on the West Coast. Um, but before we move on, uh, a chance, uh, uh, Bob and Neville, uh, for you to uh, uh, make any additional comments about uh, what uh, Doug and Catherine have, have been telling us. Well, uh, step up. <laughs> yes, Neville. Thank you, Glenn, and uh, thanks, Doug and Catherine. You know, we can we can slice this narrowly and think about, you know, the economic benefit 
and costs of the industry. And, and, and that's not at all what Salmon Wars does. It, it does take a holistic view of things, but the reality is that this industry it has resulted in the most recently domesticated animal known to humankind, a, you know, a, a wonderful wild fish, you know, known as the king of fish for hundreds of years, you know, now reduced to traits like size, like aggressiveness for food in hatcheries, its ability to survive in confined environments. And, and these fish have been bred selectively over generations and generations and generations. And now we have a new fish that is salmon by name, but far from wild salmon. And that there's, you know, not only an environmental dimension to that, but an ethical and moral dimension as well. And I hope to be able to talk more about that later. Yes. And Bob, that's a, that's a good segue, I, uh, I think, um, for me to begin my conversation with you, because as Neville said, salmon, you know, this is, we're dealing with many dimensions of salmon. And, as, uh, and, and let's pause to, to honor the salmon um, for the part it plays in um, indigenous culture, tradition, not only uh, Mi'kmaq people, of course, in, in this part of Turtle Island. I think if you uh, see how indigenous people wherever, even in, uh, including in, in Norway, the Sami people, salmon are very important to, to tradition, to culture, to connection with the ancestors. And the um, salmon are a, a feature of, uh, of, of gatherings, of eating, of celebration. So let's, let's, uh, honor that uh, as we're talking about the salmon, because we're, we're dealing with um, something very profound. Um, and Bob, you, you have the, the last part of the most recent part of your career has been in fighting fish farms on the BC coast and, um, and uh, protecting the wild uh, salmon on your coast from from fish farms, uh, and we were using your success in getting uh, fish farms out of the Discovery Islands at the mouth of the Fraser River as a as a sort of inspiration for us on, on this coast. But with the arrival of the new minister, Minister Le Boutillier, I sense that things have gotten kind of wobbly. Um, soon after she became minister, the Agricultural lobby was in Ottawa, and you followed soon after. I saw on APTN. So, could you fill us in on where things stand right now on the Pacific Coast? Where are we? Are the are the fish farms gone, or are they still not gone? Um, <clears throat> not a simple question. This this entire topic is very complicated, and that's where I think industry gets its foothold is because you have to connect all the dots for it to really be shown what a travesty open that pen fish farms are for the environment. Mm -hmm. um, I think back to when I first became elected chief of my nation, the Kwekwesutin Ukhwaklapmis, um, that was in 2005. And our people had been fighting the fish farms in our territory for almost two decades before I started. And so for the past, going on this to be 19th year fighting to protect salmon and the most uh, likely source of impact that we've identified is the open net pen fish farms. This doesn't absolve logging companies from what they've done in the watersheds. It doesn't absolve uh, man for its impact all along the Fraser River, but it is something that we can reach out and change to benefit salmon. Now, our people, we have a very rich culture. I'm one of our traditional singers, and I've been involved in our culture my entire life. And for us, the uniqueness of salmon is represented within our culture by the salmon dances bestowed upon the twins of a family. And, and because that, you know, back when our culture was first becoming, Twins were more rare than uh, what we may see today for a variety of reasons. 
Um, but it was one way that we could show how special it was. And it wasn't simply a dance. Uh, wild salmon um, are who we are as people. We, it is the basis of our culture. It's the basis of our traditions. It's the basis of our relationship to the watersheds and the forest. Then, of course, I could spend quite a few minutes speaking about Section 35.1 rights in the Supreme Court of Canada and the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. These are all foundational to this thing we call democracy in Canada. And what we're seeing is the government walking away from the foundations of this country to support an industry that has very little economic benefit, as uh, has already been spoken of. So what I wanted to, you know, like when we mentioned Norway, uh, for a number of years in a row back in the 2000s, I invited myself to the AGAs in, um, in Oslo and in Bergen, and they were very cordial, they were very um, pleasant, but I recall the last time I went was, I think it was in 2009, and that's when here in BC, Alexander Morton's court case brought the regulatory structure back to DFO from the provincial government. And at that time, I spoke with the CEO of what was then Marine Harvest, now Moe. And I asked her, I said, well, why don't you bring your best understanding of your industry's practices about disease, about pathogens, about sea lice? And I, to this day, I... I can't tell if it was just a little smile or if it was a smirk, but she said, we will, we come to Canada and do what your government allows us to. And so no matter how you slice that piece of pie, it tells me that they're not bringing their best understanding and they're being predatory and exploiting the environment of Canada for their profits. And for me, it doesn't matter what industry it is, but if that's your, if that's your approach, you're not a good corporate citizen. And this is how they try to portray themselves. But what I wanted to speak about really, and I'll get up to the, the transition planning and where we're at, but when we have an industry that's gonna operate in our country, quite often, and more so now than ever, we focus on environmental impact. So we look at what are the environmental concerns and what are the safeguards and regulation and policy that are going to protect the environment for all Canadians, not just uh, run roughshod over regulations and so forth for the benefit of, a, of an international company? And of course, with this industry, we start to, I turned and learned about disease and pathogens. And they're very real and they do have an impact on wild salmon. But when we look to the regulator now, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, then we might expect them to look out for the greater public interest, which is their constitutional obligation, which is to the environment, which is to the wild fish. And we find that they are negligent. What they've done is they've constructed something which I often think of as just a great big pretend or a big distraction. Because I've seen with First Nations, the government's love to deny the problem, delay a response, and then distract you with meaningless process. And that is true in every aspect of the fight to protect wild salmon. Because when we think about it, and you know, the concern about where does the pesticides, where do the chemicals, where do the antibiotics go is very real. Because what we have is not just the waste from the fish. And if you talk to anyone that runs a hatchery, Fish poop is pretty significant. And so when you think about that in terms of half a million fish in a farm, it's a lot of material. But then there's the uneaten food that gets out. And then it is already very ripe and full with whatever they're putting in, whether it's a, uh, a you know, uh, an antibiotic or, or pesticide. And this is something when I learned, um, there's a product called Slice. And the active ingredient to kill sea lice is called emamectin benzoate. And I couldn't believe when I, read, when I found out that this interrupts the growth cycle of crustaceans, because that's what a sea lice is. So we have crustaceans out here on, in BC. We have crabs and prawns and so on. And out east, you've got the lobster, which is the foundation of the massive economy that contributes to every coastal community, as far as I understand. 
And so then you would want to know where is the dispersal of all of this going. And they've developed something called the depot mod, and it's a waste, a solid waste dispersal modeling. And it's so funny, the guy that created it, his name is John Chamberlain, spelled L-A-I-N. And every time, I... no, and he makes sure every meeting I've been to with him is again, I'm not related to Bob. Um, you know, but, you know, that's his to carry. But what we find, and you you may have heard in the media about how we have a captured regulator where the DFO is making decisions to benefit an industry instead of its constitutional obligations. And so to, to know that is fact, we've, ac we've used access to information. We've read the internal emails from DFO. They wanted to rate or lower the average number of sea lice present on a fish farm from three motile down to one or one and a half. An industry lit their hair on fire saying it would cost us too much money. So lo and behold, there was no change. And so we have an industry explaining to the regulator how it must be. And then when we turn to things such as Piscine orthorheovirus, HSMI, or the whole myriad of other disease and pathogens, Canadians are supposed to find comfort that the DFO is something called the Canadian Science Advisory Secretariat. And they have produced uh, originally, there was nine science risk assessments to Pacific famine. But when you look at the process, never mind the outcome, look at the process where you have the department, uh, uh, the DFO's Department of Aquaculture, you have the DFO's Department of Aquaculture Science, then you have um, the proponent for the science, which is Fish Farm Company number one. And then you have industry represented. So that's fish farm companies two, three, and four. And then you have stakeholders, which are their broader associations. And they all sit down and decide what the terms of reference are. They decide how they're going to evaluate the science. They will select who's going to do the final review. Well, I mean, it's like asking a room full of Montreal Canadian fans, who's the best team? They could be in last place, but they're going to say it's Montreal. And so what we have, and it gets even worse when you look at the 10th science risk assessment on sea lice, they didn't even bother to include industry or anybody else. It was just DFO aquaculture and DFO science. And then when you look at the access to information where you see managers changing the outcome of the science paper to fit their the, the mandate to promote and expand, you makes you wonder, does, has DFO learned anything from the COD collapse? where they ignored science, where they tailored science, made decisions for management goals rather than what's uh, their obligation of looking after the stocks and the environment. And so when we think about where is it that we, I mean, if, if I could go back to the 80s when the industry first arrived here, I would have pushed for baseline science on sea lice prevalence during the off season. And what I mean by the off season, is because nature is perfect. So when wild salmon come back from the ocean, they have sea lice on them, no question about it. They go to the river and they spawn and they die. So they don't, the sea lice no longer has a host. And then in the region, there's no viable way for them to be sustained. And so when the little ones leave the river, the area is clean of sea lice larvae. And that's what I mean by nature being perfect. But what happens though, is when the, when the sea lice find one fish farm after another, after another, with anywhere from half a million to a million fish, well, when those little fish leave the river, they don't stand a chance because the area is just uh, uh, massive clouds of sea lice larvae. And this is where we see the initial impact. And then when they swim differently because they get five or six sea lice on them, they're gonna get eaten. If they pick up a disease, we won't know the impact of that because we don't follow them out into the deep ocean. Because I've learned from Dr. Christy Miller Saunders from DFO, PRV, or Piscine Ortho virus, when a fish is exposed to it, it takes six weeks for you to be able to test whether it's positive or negative. Now, when those fish go by the, the salmon farms, they're heading to the ocean. And so DFO cannot demonstrate that there is no impact. 
unless they're following those fish well up into the Gulf of Alaska, which they don't do. And so it's a way that they say, oh, there's no problem, we've tested, but in a time frame that doesn't give you a valid outcome. So when I think about DFO wanting to promote and expand this industry, this has been commented on in BC through the Cohen Commission on the Missing Sockeye from it was like 12 years ago, where DFO is in a conflict of interest because it was promoting an industry. And yet at some point they would have to decide who their favorite child was. And then this came about in the most recent uh, FOPO uh, report uh, on DFO science, where again, it mentioned this conflict of interest because sooner or later, they're gonna to have to make a choice over which one that they want to actually support. So when we have management changing the outcome of science, when we have management interfering with science being the guider, they have made a decision to not look after the environment and wild fisheries. That should be a concern across the country for every Canadian, not just First Nations that have Aboriginal rights to fish, because when we think of the Supreme Court of Canada, we have conservation as first, First Nations use second, and then fisheries. And aquaculture is deemed by the courts as a fishery. So they need to be able, the government needs to be able to get back to the foundations of what it is that they're created to do since this country began. And recall and meaningfully embrace the science that has shown all around the world from true peer reviewed processes, where a scientist will give his paper and the journal will say, thank you very much. And they bring some people in, some experts to, to evaluate or peer review it. Unlike what we get from the Canadian government, where you have industry that's gonna benefit from a positive outcome, developing how they're gonna examine and who's gonna do the final report. It is so, so conflicted, there is absolutely no credibility for that science that DFO stands on. And Bob, to make I it worse, could, we, I wonder if I could just yeah. at, at that point, uh, it's interesting what, how you describe it there because uh, you think of the that British, uh, uh, TV series, Yes, Minister, where the minister um, is <laughs> uh, is just one person at the uh, in the middle of this uh, DFO uh, aquaculture industry um, uh, sort of machine there, and how how difficult it is for the minister to make any any change in in the way things are proceeding, and it's, perhaps it's significant that the former minister Joyce Murray who's from your heart of the country. I think she was in the BC provincial government before she went federal. She has an, she had an, has an environmental background. She was, she might, we might say environmentally literate. So she had her own background to bring to that portfolio. Whereas mm -hmm. now we have a new minister, Minister Le Boutillier, and I'm not sure we know little about her, or at least uh, I do, but um, I don't think she has the, um, the, the background as uh, as Joyce um, mm -hmm. Joyce Murray did and I I wonder what uh, you think the significance of uh, having someone like Joyce Murray with some with some experience and, and background in the issues um, coming to uh, the uh, the office of minister well, I think you know when we when we have a minister we definitely want to have someone uh, that just wasn't friendly or popular enough or the writing was important enough for them to be awarded a, to be a minister, that they would have the background to understand. But when I think of um, uh, the previous minister to Joyce, Bernadette, and then Joyce, they did something really hugely significant in terms of their decision making on Discovery Islands. They embraced the precautionary principle. And that is a foundation to, I believe it's the Oceans Act or the Fisheries Act, where in the absence of concise science, you err on the side of caution. And so they did that. And Joyce Murray, she did what I've seen, probably the only time I've seen, where the federal government embraced the width and depth of the Supreme Court law on consultation with First Nation, because it says even the potential to infringe Aboriginal rights triggers the duty to consult. And so what Joyce Murray did 
that she realized that the fish that are coming up from the Fraser River well up into the deep interior of BC, those fish had the potential to die at a fish farm on the coast. And that represented an infringement of Aboriginal rights. So now this, this transition planning process that's been underway, it has been, uh, we call it, I mean, the very first meeting I attended with Minister Murray, the questions that the DFO presented to guide the discussion were nothing better than buffalo jump. It didn't matter how you answered the question, the DFO could interpret it as a solution or support for the industry. And we called that out from day to one. It didn't change it when it became the transition plan. Each section, there's four components. We have now completed three of them. And we get these what we heard reports. And instead of it being uh, a way to document that said, oh, three First Nations love this and 58 said they hate it. They're living in words like some and most and a few. And so it doesn't really give you what you need to know as a minister to be able to make a good decision. And this is what we saw in the Discovery Islands and why we had a judicial review is because the department did not arm the minister for either answer. They only armed her for the answer of yes. And one of the things that I was able to be a part of before I got out of politics, we implemented the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People in the Broughton Archipelago. And that's where I'm from. And we sat with the provincial government in a transparent and inclusive process that engaged with stakeholders, which is the fish farm companies. And we developed joint recommendations that went to our decision makers. And we had an outcome that was not contested in court because it was inclusive. It was transparent. And so what we have now is we're trying to uh, get uh, the new minister to understand the Broughton Archipelago Transition Initiative and why it has such good applicability for the broader transition plan. Now, I've met with the minister and a number of other ministers and senior officials and been speaking to them about this because what we have in the face of this objection to the industry are nations that have made the choice to accept the handshake. And so the handshake is, uh, in the courts, it was reported as 12.3 million a year to allow the farms to operate in their territories. And so what they've put forward is something that really, it, it just turns Canadian law and process and conflict of interest and throws it out the door. It is so rife with conflict and it doesn't meet the standards that Canadians would expect in a shared decision-making model with First Nations and the Crown. But these are discussions that were just beginning to have with the minister. I worry that uh, being a new minister, um, I think her senior staff is very, very key to educate, which we have been working very hard to do. But at the end of the day, First Nations, we don't have an endless pot of money to go and lobby every day of the week in Ottawa like the industry does, which supports the nations that want the industry in their territories. So we're up against it. But what we've managed to do with the Wild Salmon Alliance in BC is identify over 120 First Nations that support the transition of fish farms from the ocean. Now we talked about land-based closed containment earlier. It's happening globally. I mean, we've got uh, we've got the one that's at Mount Fuji. We've got ones in Denmark, Florida, Maine. I mean, it's happening. And I saw, and I have a screen capture actually of uh, an article from Intrafish, which is an industry publication. And a number of years ago, they said that they're gonna do a monthly newsletter on the hottest growing sector in aquaculture globally, and that is land-based closed containment. And so it's happening, it's just not here. And what I think the problem is, I mean, what investor would want to come to a country because it's a significant investment in land-based closed containment, but what investor would want to come to a country that is still pandering to the open net pens because they, they wouldn't have any measure of certainty neither. And so what I think what I'm hoping for is not, not I think, what I'm hoping for is watching this global trend and concern for the environment and sustainable products is gonna continue to grow. And then when we have land-based closed containment, which is a, would be a more sustainable model and offloading waste into the environment and chemicals and therapeutics 
and antibiotics at the expense of the environment, that the consumer will make an, a choice which is better for the planet. Now we, uh, we, we have, have a, no... uh, yep. Sorry, we have sorry. A, qu a question for you from a listener uh, regarding right. uh, sea lice. And the, mm -hmm. the viewer asks, is the use of lumpfish proposed by Paul Antle's Marabees? And that's, uh, that's a discussion happening in uh, here in Newfoundland about the use of lumpfish uh, to deal with uh, sea lice. Have you heard uh, that discussion about, um, about lumpfish as, a, as a, a kind of natural predator to deal with uh, sea lice? Well, I would like, I don't know what a lumpfish is, but I'm guessing it's got gills and fins. But um, when we start thinking about the volume of sea lice, we, we have to wrap our minds around that. So here in, in BC, where we have successive fish farms on a tide, that each of them have a million fish, the regulation is you need, if there's three larvae producing sea lice, average, the industry must treat that farm. So let's pick a farm where there's only half a million fish. Three average is 1.5 million sea lice producing, I think it's like two or 300 larvae each. And then that's reproduced, if not doubled by the next farm and the next farm and the next farm. And then the tide goes back and forth. And Discovery Islands, where I was one of the lead negotiators for three of the First Nations, that area of the coast is highly stratified waters. And that was identified in a federal and provincially government approved document. And so what you have is that larva is staying in that one portion of the water column mm -hmm. and that just happens to be where the migration is occurring. And the industry loves to have a good tidal flush where they have their farms because it magically gets rid of all the solid waste, magically. Uh, if you're a Harry Potter fan, you'll believe that. But the thing is though, that's exactly where the wild salmon out, make, out migrate as well. And in our territories of the Broughton, we remove two fish farms immediately in our process because the closest river was what people know as Bond Sound, but we call it Hada. It was down to 300 pink salmon or 200, two or 300. Two years later, after we removed the farms, we had 30 to 40,000 come back. And it was because the, the tide brought every fish from Hada directly to Glacier Falls. And after that, directly to the Birdwood group. When we got rid of those, we had returns that we hadn't seen in a long time. And that's the second time in 30 years where we had a movement of fish farm stock and saw a corresponding uptick in uh, salmon returning. Glenn, this is Doug. Can I uh, answer the lumpfish question here? Yes. Awesome. Um, two things. Lumpfish were introduced first in Norway to deal with the sea lice problem there. And about two years ago, when we were looking deeply into it, 150,000 lumpfish a day die in salmon farms in Norway. They die because they get eaten by the salmon in those farms. They die from diseases of their own. If you look at an, this from an animal welfare standpoint, you're killing a species of fish, a pelagic <laughs> fish, to save this fish to put on our dinner tables. That is the very definition of a harm industry. And that brings it back to Newfoundland because there's a team of anthropologists at Memorial University led by a professor named Dean Bavington who wrote a paper a few years ago and that it was about how industrialized aquaculture is a harm industry akin to tobacco and fossil fuels. And that is the sense in the sense that they ignore the environment, they ignore public health and environmental health and other damages to produce their profit-making pro product. It's in oil, fossil fuels, you can see it very really. In tobacco industry, you can see it. The problem with aquaculture is so much of this happens below the surface and people just don't understand what's going on. This is a harm industry, same as fossil fuels and tobacco. You make a great point. And when I mentioned earlier about deny the problem, delay the response and then distract with meaningless process. That's what I, this was what you shared. That sounds what the lump fish is. It's a distraction. Out here in BC, they developed these, they're called uh, hydro lysers and freshwater baths. 
for for salmon farms. And but the problem is if you get a fish farm in a channel and it, it's producing sea lice larvae that's going into the environment and represents an attack on wild salmon. Mm -hmm. What's the difference then if you take that fish from one side of the channel in a boat and go around the point and blast all the sea lice off the fish and then dump all the water into the channel? There's yeah. no yes. difference. Yeah. It still represents the impact. But they say, well, we've invested $60 million yeah. in this boat. But it doesn't. No, go ahead. Uh, this, this brings me to a point that I missed where when you think about DFO regulations, it's all about fish health inside the pen. Not outside the pen, but inside the pen. So they've they've abandoned their, their primary responsibility of looking after the environment and wild fisheries. And they bury science. We put in uh, an appeal to the privacy commissioner where we, and we were successful. And you may have seen it in the media for a, a, a moment where DFO hid a science paper for 10 years. And it was a science paper done by their own scientists, which showed the jumping of Pisces virus to Pacific Chinook salmon. So when they have in the transition planning process, we got to rebuild trust and transparency. They still don't get it. We requested the sea lice data from that Kent Science Risk Assessment a year ago, and we still don't have it. And we're entering the last phase of the transition planning process. So when they say they're going to make trans uh, transparent science decision making tomorrow, but they're still not doing it today, there is no reason to trust this machine of DFO to do what's right for its primary constitutional obligations. And even if Doug, they... you were you were going to make a point, and uh, and then why don't we go to um, to uh, to Neville? Um, Doug, okay. your Let, point yeah, first. The last last point I wanted to make, Glenn, and, and I'm glad that Bob brought up thermolysers, hydrolysers. They're called also, mm -hmm. and it's another inhumane method of dealing with this problem. They pump the fish out of the out of the pens through tubes and they give them a hot water bath to clean off these sea lice and then they pump them they put they pump them through tubes back in to the cages right. but what this is a cold water fish and these are sentient creatures there are plenty of scientific studies that show salmon feel pain salmon get confused and these thermolysers cause enormous amounts of pain to them here you've got another example of a harm industry not giving a damn what they do to these fish because it's all about the profit. This is the most uh, agreed driven, profit driven industry. And, and may I add one thing? Bob has spoken yeah. so eloquently about the situation on the West Coast, but you're talking about Newfoundland. The West Coast, there's a constitutional irregularity in Canada. The, DA, the, the federal government regulates the fisheries on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. On the East Coast, the fisheries are considered, these salmon farms are considered agricultural and they're under the control of the province. Mm -hmm. This is part of the reason that BC has been able to make some progress, whereas our four provincial premiers have doubled down on this filthy industry and we are not making progress and we're in real danger. If they do succeed in closing down the fish farms in BC, where do you think those far, those companies are going to go? They're going to go to Newfoundland and Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. This is this uh, is something we have to deal with as a country. That, In fact, you know, uh, I, a few years I, ago, I, I, hear when, you, uh, I hear you and I agree with you because th that's why I tried to focus on the the process of science and the process of regulations because those would be applicable provincially or federally, right? And so. That, that's why I, I chose to focus primarily on that to hopefully give some clues as to things that you would want to advance in your public forums to your elected officials. But in, in terms of the C, uh, the hydrolyzer, they like to characterize it, oh, it's like a, like a hot tub or a jacuzzi. No, it's like a power washing of the fish. And the problem with that is then it also, when it rips the sea lice from the flesh of the fish, it also perforates the skin. And then they put it back in the fish farm. Well, that's where you start to have concerns about Panacebaculum, which is a bacteria, which is well known in Discovery Islands as an example. 
and it's commonly referred to as mouth rot, but there are a number of other things that happen. But you see, by dealing with one issue, you create the perfect circumstance for the other issue to come in and affect, which then is another disease or bacterial opportunity to kill our wild fish. Neville, let's let's uh, bring you into the conversation again. And um, I wonder if we can start by uh, uh, confirming what I think is the, there's the science, the science as we know it, uh, with the def- even with the deficiencies that Bob has described, I think it's accepted now that there is a link between sea-based aquaculture and the decline of the wild Atlantic salmon. Uh, various people have said, oh, it might be the seals, it might be the warming of the water. How do we know it's the, the fish farms? Um, but I, I think that, that uh, we're beyond that now and uh, it's accepted that um, sea-based aquaculture is a factor in uh, wild Atlantic salmon decline. Is that is that fair to say? Not just a factor, Glenn, but a major driver of decline. And if if I seem a little nervous speaking to the audience that's out there tonight, it's because the stakes couldn't be higher for wild Atlantic salmon. You know, what, is, what has precipitated this forum um, you know, what's behind this discussion is the fact that the province of Newfoundland and Labrador is considering allowing one of the largest expansions of this industry in Canadian history from Bay de Spear over to Port of Basque, covering a massive swath of the south coast of Newfoundland and Labrador. Doug and Catherine reference the research on aquaculture and its characterization as a harm industry. And a feature of a harm industry is the injection of doubt and denial. We still see that, you know, as recently as this week here in New Brunswick, where another salmon escape was reported, we have officials from Cook Aquaculture saying, we simply raise native Atlantic salmon. Well, not the case at all. These are genetically distinct animals, selectively bred over generations and generations and generations to the point where they are visibly different from their wild cousins. The impacts are demonstrated, they're significant, and there's absolutely no doubt whatsoever. We've focused a lot on the role of of DFO. And in in many ways, the role of of DFO has been, you know, at worst, reprehensible, at best, disappointing. But the key decision makers for us in Atlantic Canada are our provincial premiers. You know, whether or not this industry can expand in Newfoundland and Labrador and wreak havoc on wild Atlantic salmon populations from Bay to Spear to Port of Basque on Atlantic herring populations. That decision lies in the Premier's office, as it does here in New Brunswick, as it does in Nova Scotia. We've, we've seen it time and time again. In Atlantic Canada, wherever the industry exists, wild Atlantic salmon populations that are adjacent to the industry are assessed as threatened or endangered by the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. And we've identified three major pathways why that's occurring. It is escapes, it's parasites, and it's disease. And arguably nowhere in the world is the situation worse than it is right now on the south coast of Newfoundland. That's uh, that's, um alarming uh, Neville to when you put it in those terms um, it's uh, we're dealing with a critical situation critical critical choices um, the Atlantic Seven Federation uh, I understand has increased its presence in Newfoundland and Labrador many people will know the name Donna Ivany who's been um, uh, well known for speaking about salmon issues over the years, but uh, I understand you've increased ASF resources in um, in the province. Uh, tell us about that. Well, 
you know, perhaps for people that that don't know about us, um, the Atlantic Salmon Federation was founded in 1948. And our mission can be summed up in four simple words, wild salmon and wild rivers. It's the protection of wild fish and the protection of the environment. Aquaculture isn't the only issue we deal with. We have programs going from Southern Maine to the West Coast of Greenland, but where the industry is present, it is a very, very significant concern for wild Atlantic salmon. And the South Coast of Newfoundland in the world right now is, is ground zero for those impacts. And, and that's why we're focused on that expansion. And we've had a lot of discussions about this internally. Uh, we've had strong arguments back and forth. And where we sit today is that until the government of Canada, until the provinces in Atlantic Canada can prove that they have met our country's international obligations, which are to reduce harms from the parasites that drift out of the cages by the billions, to eliminate escapes from the cages, which happen by the millions around the North Atlantic every year. There is no license, social or economical, for this industry to expand in our region. And that's where the Atlantic Salmon Federation is today. And we are willing to bring whatever resources we have, whatever knowledge we've gained over 75 years of conservation and whatever strength and, and will we have to protect wild salmon and wild rivers, we're willing to bring that to bear on the south coast of Newfoundland. Mm. So when you say this, the south coast of Newfoundland is, uh, is ground zero, um, what what are the factors that uh, make it ground zero in from your point of view? I guess it's the the contemplation of that large number of um, of uh, fish farms along that coast. Um, what else? What else about the situation on the south coast uh, concerns the Atlantic Salmon Federation? The best predictor of future performance is the past and potentially nowhere else in North America has the record of the industry been so poor. Um, mortality rates, you know, well above 20% climbing into the 30% on a given year. Um, very compelling and rigorous scientific research that showed widespread hybridization between escapes from these sea cages, fish that, you know, still have some semblance of wild instinct, a percentage of them are fertile, they return to rivers, they spawn with wild fish, and that has been documented widely along the south coast of Newfoundland. It has led to the near collapse of salmon in places like the Con River, uh, you know, rivers all around Fortune Bay, Bay to Spear, and we know what the outcome of expansion will be, and it's further devastation with few to any long-term economic benefits for the province of Newfoundland, for the people of Canada. This is an asset that's, that's held in public trust. These are our public oceans. These are our wild fish stocks. And we're allowing the destruction of those for the private profit of others. At this point, we don't believe that there's, there's any recourse to look at the past until we can stop that expansion in the future. And that's why we're laser focused on that. Hmm. Um, Catherine, uh, Doug, Bob, um, uh, any... Um... Any comments uh, from you to what uh, Neville has told us? Uh, obviously, we're at a special moment because we have discussion about that marine conservation area on the south coast. So we are um, we are at a pivotal moment here, where uh, we know that the expansion uh, of uh, fish farms, um, shall we say, is not uh, is not a good fit. Uh, to put it in very neutral terms for a marine conservation area. So there's uh, 
uh, it's an important conversation that uh, we should be having, but uh, it's uh, despite all the issues at stake, it's a, a very muted conversation thus far. Um, surprisingly, not uh, as much um, debate about uh, uh, what's what's happening. Maybe that will maybe that will change. Maybe some news media will take more of an interest. Um, uh, so, uh, Doug, Catherine, Bob, Neville, uh, any, um, any concluding comments, uh, from you? Mm -hmm. Uh, and Tara, I'm just looking at the, I think we're caught up with the uh, questions as far as I can see. No, actually we have a, a request from, uh, Megan Sams who may be on the Southwest coast, if I have an inkling who that is, Ashley Hall and Megan Sams have a question about human social effects, and they're wondering if they can ask it on mic. Yeah. Um, Hillary, can, are you able to um, enable the microphone? Way hi. Uh, Yes, I'm on the Southwest Coast, Tara. You're right. It's Megan Sams. Hi. So I have first a little bit of context. I'm Indigenous to Cauteroy Valley and Southern BC. I'm Mi'kmaq from Cauteroy Valley and Unklakapmuk from Lytton. Oh, wow. Yeah, hi. <laughs> my, my, my son's mother is Unklakapmuk. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> um, <laughs> So my home here, my home community in Codroy Valley is where the Grand Codroy River and the Little Codroy River flow. And they were both very full salmon rivers for a very long time. Um, I swim in these rivers now and I experience them. I've seen a steep decline in biodiversity in these rivers and I now experience them as, as dead rivers. Um, I'm very scared of fish farms. I boycott farmed salmon. I've I read Salmon Wars last January. This has been a long um fear for me, like a direct fear for my home territories. And something I've noticed, particularly here in Ukdahamguk in Newfoundland, is a, a a intense social division that comes with dialogue around environmental concerns. Um, here in the Valley right now, we're experiencing that around GH2 and uh, hydrogen, hydrogen projects. So paired with wind turbines. So I guess my question is if any of the panelists can share reflections or thoughts or experiences or advice on um, kind of the social division that happens because it creates such a huge distraction to policymakers, multinationals, and, and informed education. It keeps informed education from the people when there's such a distraction. So I just wondered if anyone had thoughts, advice, observations to share about those things. And thank you very much. Well, I think that's a great question and, and an, an enormously important topic. We ran into that, those very divisions um, when we were down in Harbor Breton meeting with uh, Gary Snook and his wife, Georgina. Um, Gary had taken a boatload of people out to see the Maui die off in all late August of uh, 2019. And he got in trouble with family and friends who told him, keep your mouth shut. We have a chapter in Salmon Wars called Keep Your Mouth Shut. And Gary was told to keep quiet. Otherwise, they were concerned that the fish farms would leave and the jobs would leave. And in fact, the salmon farming industry and aquaculture in general has been very clever and very manipulative and very deceptive in locating their fish farms and their plants in remote areas where admittedly people do need the jobs and where all politicians are going to hear about when they go there is we need jobs, we need these fish farms to stay. That's the most short-sighted perspective possible for people who live there, who depend on the ocean, who have for centuries, and for politicians who are, who are in, in office 
to protect the environment and to protect our common resources. So I think that question you've raised and that issue is really important. And thank you for reading Salmon Wars. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the, the problem that I've seen with government is that, you know, there's the, the one thing that's sacred to an MP or an MLA is your vote. And what's really important is getting reelected. So it may not be so much about the long-term uh, health and, and of the environment and wild fisheries, but it may come down to jobs, jobs, jobs. And industry darn well knows that. And so that's what their diatribe is always about jobs. Next thing you know, you'll see your kids' soccer teams with jerseys from the fish farm company if the church gets new chairs and so on and so on. So And they've, they've got a well-practiced regime to get into the communities. But what I would suggest is I, I, I want to believe that Canadians, just like the global society, is waking up to the need for better environmental sustainability, period. Whether it's global warming and everything else that falls down from that massive domino. But it's the, the people that are starting to turn their attention to ecosystems and the need for them to be healthy and abundant and to be able to sustain a, a diversity of things is what this planet needs. And, I, and that would be the approach that, that we've been taking, just mobilizing everyone that's involved in a wild fishery and not just catching, but the wilderness tourism associations and different unions that, that support and so on. So we've been able to show the politicians the broad support for the economy of a wild fishery, whether it's catching or watching the bears eat them, but it's an economy that far is far greater than what the aquaculture industry actually pumps into the economy. You got to remember, if they stop at Timmy's for a double double in the morning, that gets counted as a great contribution from fish. You know? Bob, a comment uh, here in regard to something you said before. Keep in mind, with respect to the marine conservation area, that exceptions can be made. Bob's chat about what happened in BC in regard to process or lack thereof, and the ability of lobbyists to influence outcomes needs to be front. Mm -hmm of mind in those protected area uh, right. conversations. You know, I, I, uh, I can't, you know, Glenn, I want to, there's something I, I just really want to quickly summarize because I, I don't want to just complain. I want to give some suggestions so people can take and consider. And so what you're going to want, I think, is as deep and thorough a baseline examination as you can get. Like serious tidal modeling, not just the depot model that DFO has. You're going to want to have independent monitoring and oversight of the industry with the capacity dollars to remain independent and then have jointly agreed upon science from the beginning to the end with a path that the outcome changes the operations, not to be given to management to decide, but something that's very crisp and clear and to map out your locations of other productive fisheries so you can monitor them. And, and like was spoken of earlier, those long history of catches would be critical to make sure that you're going to protect them as you go forward. Tara, you have another comment. I think. No, that was the one you just read. <laughs> oh, I see. Very oh, good. Uh, Catherine, uh, Catherine has something to say. If, if, if I could. Um, oh, I think I, I, a, really, a really significant part of this, and this goes to, to Megan's question, is the fact that most people just don't know and it's part of the of the brilliance of the subtitle of Doug and Catherine's book and it's the the underbelly of our favorite fish could you imagine driving down the highway and seeing 30 percent of cattle in a field laying dead and being eaten alive by flies it would be abhorrent it would be a lightning rod for public attention what we're talking about here happens under the surface, but it is having arguably greater effects because things in the water behave differently than they do in the air. When when people go to the supermarket shelf and they see a, a pink marbled filet on ice and it's Atlantic salmon, well, wonderful. And the research backs that up. Um, you know, some of the most recent opinion polling in Atlantic Canada that, that we're aware of shows that about 15% of people are opposed to industrial salmon farming. 
about 15% of people are supportive. And you've got this huge group of people in the middle who more or less don't know because it's happening under the surface. And I think that that's the challenge for everybody who cares about wild fish and the environment to help people differentiate between what they see on the supermarket shelves and what they could pull out of the river, put a tag on and bring home for their family. And that's that's what ASF stands for, wild fish and wild rivers. Well, perhaps that's a good note to uh, to end our conversation this evening. I think I think we are... Glenn Catherine had a had something that she wanted to say. Did you, Catherine? We you were you need last to last word to you, yourself, Catherine. Though. Last word to you, Catherine. We can't hear you. That <laughs> muted me. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Did he do it on purpose? I just want to second what both Bob and Neville said about the oceans being a public trust. This world does not belong to us. It, we are simply borrowing it from our children. And I think we have to step back and remind ourselves of this because we want this to be in place for them, for the generations to come. Catherine and Doug, thank you to you. Bob, thank you to you. And Neville, thanks for being here for this uh, very important conversation. Uh, Tara, any concluding comments I just, from you? I want to thank you all so much. You've given... Um me and I'm sure everyone who's listened so much to think about and, and to process. Um, and so I, I thank you so much for, for sharing your, your knowledge and your time with us. Uh, and I want to make my last pitch for Enviro Watch NL. Um, obviously, we've had a, a lot of people listening in tonight. I know there's there's 60 on Zoom and there's a lot on Facebook. I don't even know how many. And a lot of people will go and watch the recording after uh, after tonight. So uh, there's obviously a lot of uh, hunger for these kinds of events in our province. Um, people want the information. People care about our beautiful province, um, you know, and, and they um, they want to do something about it. So I encourage them to join us. Go to envirowatchnl.com. Become a member. We are volunteers. We all have other jobs. And, uh, you know, join us, join us, um, mm -hmm. because the, things don't have to be this way. We live in one of the most beautiful places in the world, and we have a responsibility uh, to this place and to the creatures that we share it with. So please join us at EnviroWatch NL, and thank you to, uh, to all our guests tonight. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Good, good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thanks for having me. Good night. Good night.